Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I've been excited all week. We have Rick Sassari, who's one of the legends and pioneers of direct response marketing with his many successful infomercials. He has helped sell more than $2 billion worth of product and launched over 30 brands, including all ones we've heard of, Sonicare, OxyClean, the George Foreman Grill, Juice Man, GoPro Camera, and many more. He's the author of Buy Now, and as I describe it to people when they ask me, he helps turn great products into $100 million companies and household names. Rick, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, it's great to be here, Jeremy. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm excited and uh, you know, I know this could go for 10 hours. I'm gonna to restrict myself. Um, but the first thing is I wanna get into your life and what's the powerful things that you've created. I always like to start off with some of the quick, a quick win someone can get and right off the bat with their copy or sales message. And you mentioned customers, interviewing customers. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, well, it's funny. Um, you, uh, at the, we were talking before the interview started and you mentioned about interviewing, um, you know, 55 people and you probably know more than just about anyone how much information you glean from an interview. And I think a lot of people overlook it, it. Probably one of the best parts of my business is when I'm working on a project is I get to interview not only customers, I'll get to interview um, experts in a category, lots of doctors, scientists. And without fail, I always learn n new information from those interviews. But what really helps me the most, and you know, if, if you had to say, what's the biggest secret in making some of these shows successful? Yeah. Um, it's... I interview the the customers who have been using the product and and normally to make one of these these infomercials I'll interview 25 or 30 people and you start to see exactly in interviewing them I'll have a list of 20 or 25 questions and you start to see exactly what the people like what they don't like why they would buy a product and it's and it's better than any focus group that I've ever been in you, you know focus groups are great but these are people that have actually spent their money on a product they had a reason for buying it solved the need and they'll tell you all this information if you write the right questions so if you're in a position where you're working on a project or you have your own project the best thing you can do is is um, uh, interview existing customers um, as many as possible and it'll be really clear to you what might need to change in your marketing message um, or advertising and if for some reason you're a startup you don't have new customers yet get people to try the product and then talk to them and I and I think probably for me that might be one of the single biggest uh, things that would be helpful I love that and so Rick what are some of the questions you ask um, you know, I really start off, and 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 it's going to be really similar to to you've interviewed a lot of people, and what I do is I actually start off like you, and I start off talking about um, their personal, their background, nothing to do with the product, uh, just because the biggest thing is when people get in front of the camera, normally they're like a deer in the headlights, and they don't want to open up, and so sometimes we even have to. Um, trick people and the camera's rolling and they don't even know it because they'll be talking a mile a minute and then the and then the camera starts and all of a sudden they feel like they have to act a little bit differently. Right. So if you capture those real yeah you know real conversations, mm -hmm. that's where the good information come comes out. So um, basically, it's uh, it starts off I uh, you know just getting people comfortable, a conversation going, talking about them, their background, what they do for work. Um, and then I, and I, you know, and then all of a sudden I'll, I'll put in, you know, well, what made you buy this product? What do you like about it? Um, how do you use it in your life? What, what kind of results have you gotten? And then based on, um, some of the answers that people give me, I then adapt the next question. Like if I hear a piece of information, I'll like, you know, I'll kind of expand on, on the question. So I start with kind of a list of questions, but then I go where the, where the interview person takes me mm -hmm. and, um, and it, it, and the questions are sort of the same, but sort of different depending on the product. And really, it's just trying to have a, a, a conversation. Like I tell people, it's like, okay, we're living next door and we're having a conversation over the backyard fence, and you're you're trying to explain to me why you bought this product, why you like it, and that's when all the good information starts coming out. 
Yes. And I had to be selfish and ask that question because I want to hear it. You've conducted many, many interviews um, mm -hmm. and see how you do it. So what's something that you discovered that surprised you through this process that made you kind of change the message or the product? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, uh, boy, there's probably a zillion examples. Um, you know, when we started off, um, and this goes back a little while, doing the Sonicare toothbrush. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. this was a relatively new product. Um, it was a hundred and fifty dollar toothbrush that they were trying to launch into the marketplace. Yeah. And so we were interviewing people, and the the actual um, management of the company they were they were all scientists, so they were coming at it from a very and the message was important about, you know, you had to educate people about gum disease and then show how the sonic care could help reverse the gum disease. There were clinical studies. Right. But what came out most in the interviews was um, the, the um, how, how the, I guess, the vanity part, how white the teeth ah, were, ah. How, and, the, and how important that was and how easy it was. And, and how it felt their, made the people's teeth and gums feel. And even a few years later, after the product got a little bigger, it was on Oprah Winfrey, and she made a comment like, it really makes your gum zing. And, and uh, you know, so that, that was something where you went in more a little bit scientific, clinical, helping gum disease, and came away from the interviews with everyone was saying they loved the way it made their teeth. It made them whiter. Uh, uh, you know, anyway, that, that was a, a pretty big example yeah. of changing direction from what we originally thought. I love that because you go in as a scientist, you think, oh, it's going to you know, prevent cavities, but people just care that it makes their mouth feel clean or that it makes it whiter. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So yep. was there something, what about with the juicer, the juice man? Well, you know, the juicer um, was a little bit different and that, and that, and I got into that project because I personally was just always interested in health and um, yeah. I was actually started juicing back in the mid uh, 80s and read a whole bunch of books by someone named Dr. Norman Walker. Um, and um, uh, That's very ahead of the times. I mean, right now it's popular, but then... Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I don't know how, why, I, I guess I do know, we can get into it later in the yeah. interview, you know, my dad died really young from a heart attack. Right. I was always into health, trying, you know, trying to uh, obviously live a healthy lifestyle because yeah. I saw what it did to him. And um, so I think that's one reason I gravitated to, to juicing. And so I got into juicing and and I just, you know, saw the benefits. It was to me, it just made so much sense um, about a, an easy way to get good nutrition into your body. You know, the government's been trying for 25 years or longer to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables. Here's an easy way to get more fruits and vegetables into your diet. And so that one I came into having a lot probably much more experienced than the people I was trying to market to mm. about the product and the benefits of it. And um, so that was fairly easy. And then also having an amazing, uh, you know, once in a lifetime spokesperson like Jake, Jake Cordich, who lived and breathed the product. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that fair, from a selling standpoint was fairly easy. You put Jay in front of the camera he'll, and he would do the rest for you. Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, you have more experience with that product, but the beginning of your book, by now, what I like what you say is something about don't make assumptions. Don't go in just assuming things. Yeah. You know, is that, could that be a detriment? And Oh, it's always a detriment. And I, and I think a little bit later in some of the, um, you know, pr you know, the questions you were asking uh, that we, you, you know, to work on prior to the interview, um, you asked what mistakes people make. And I think probably one of the single biggest mistakes is going into a marketing situation with assumptions based on your beliefs, right. your experiences, right. and you have to kind of go in neutral and again, get that feedback yeah. from people that are using the product and hear it from their perspective. In other words, it, you have to expand outside of your your little universe or big unit, whatever it is. And and, and I think that's probably one of the biggest um, mistakes that I see yeah. many people making when it comes to marketing. How do you it's, do that though? Because especially with you have year, decades of experience, you're like, I kind of know what works. How do you go in with a clean slate and neutral each time? 
Yeah, and I, I think sometimes it, 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 I just have to remind myself of, of, of why, you, you know, that you need to do that because right. sometimes somebody will say, oh, here's a new invention and they put it out to me and I'll start thinking, well, geez, I think it would work for this, this, and this. But I always step back and say, and, and kind of try to start every project the same way. You know, we get the, 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 the download of information from the people that invented the product or the management team or whoever we're, we're working with, the inventor. And, but then it's always, I always value the feedback from the customers as we talked earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just the biggest thing is keeping an open mind to what they're, they're telling us. Mm -hmm. Are there any other big surprising things that you discovered from the customer feedback that you remember? Wow. I would have never thought of that without interviewing a customer. Oh yeah. I'm sure there are. I'll tell you what, let me um, think about that as we go on with the interview sure. and I'll and we'll circle back. Sure. So I want to hear about your influences growing up. Your, I know your grandfather and your dad were big influences. Yeah, well, my my um, grandfather, like a lot of other people um, in the in the states, came over as an immigrant from Italy. You know, came over with nothing. Uh, you know, and through hard work, he started a grocery store, and that developed and opened up a couple other businesses, and you, you know, just through you know, one of the American typical American stories for mm -hmm. someone that comes over as an immigrant and works hard and is able to you know become successful. And from an influence standpoint, I remember um, working as a, a stock boy in our grocery store. And this wasn't a big grocery store. It was a small um, store in, in, in uh, uh, a little town in New York called Valhalla, which is north of New York City. And um, I would go down and be stocking. And my grandfather was uh, 91 years old, and he was still wow. working in the grocery store. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. So for me, from a role model, that, that was one thing as far as uh, – um, a, a work ethic. The other thing I noticed growing up, and again, this will date, date me from an age standpoint, but my grandfather, he, he had lived through the depression. And so he wouldn't waste anything. If there was a little scra scrap of string and a little, you know, piece of paper, he never, never would waste anything it was very frugal. So, um, I learned a lot from him and I think my dad was a chip off of his dad's shoulder. And so I, I learned a lot of, of the same lessons from, from him as well. So what was it like working with your grandfather when he, I mean, wh I guess what age went, was he when you were working in the store? Um, you know, it was, uh, he was probably between 85 and Whoa. 90. I was just in my, uh, and I'm, I'm one of eight children. I was in next to the youngest. So, wow. um, uh, I was, um, pr I was, uh, you know, probably in, um, you know, like, between nine and 12 type of thing. Yeah. So, um, it was a huge age difference there, but, um, it was good experience. And that was, I learned a lot, um, from there because, um, it's, it's funny, things come full circle. Um, I, you know, working in a grocery store, one of the things that we did, um, at the time is we delivered groceries. And if mm. you think about all the online businesses that have, tried to get, especially in the late 90s, to start up delivering groceries. And I knew from working in the grocery business that that was a hard nut to crack because the margins are so slim in the grocery business. And how could you do that? And, you know, and, and we were, we, we would do this as a service, but I remember it was something where we always lost money on it. So then when, it, you know, it was funny to see the parallel between what I grew up with and then all of a sudden a big internet company is trying, trying to do the, the same thing. But I remember, um, uh, that really in, our, in that grocery business um, was really learning a lot about um, service and the customer comes first and the customer is always right. Mm. Th those types of lessons. Yeah. So. I guess I know you, you crack that nut. You have to have eight kids that can deliver groceries, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how was it growing up in a household with eight kids? I was great. Um, you know, just always something happening. Um, you huge meals, you know, dinner time around the table was always fun. It, it just, you know, just um, uh, a really nice, nice childhood where we where we grew up in in New York. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure crazy I'm, times. Um, yeah. So what, you know, Rick, what was the early days of your career look like? Where did you start? Well, uh, probably I don't know. Some people know exactly what they want to do right away. I I I'm I moved around a little bit. I I lived in the New York area. Um, uh, till I was 16 years old, uh, I was a junior in high school. My family moved to Florida and, um, I finished my last, uh, year and a half in Daytona beach, Florida. And 
I had a friend, um, a good friend that we, we played sports together and, and we sat down, we were seniors and, um, we just said, okay, we're going to go to dental school. That's what we're going to do with dental our school. School. Okay. Exactly. So, um, I ended up going to school back in Western Pennsylvania, a small college called Westminster college. Um, I had relatives in the area and actually my mom had went to school there. So there was a connection. Um, and I studied science and I, I, I have a degree, a master, uh, not a master's, a, uh, a master's of science, um, uh, uh, not a master's degree, but a um, you know just a degree, a biology degree, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so when I graduated, I applied and I was accepted to the University of Pittsburgh Dental School. And then I sat back and said, I'm not sure that that's what I want to be or do. So I said, Well, I'm going to take a year off and just go back down to, to to Florida and sort through things. And then if I decide to do that, I'll I can go back and and start in a year. So I went back down to Florida and just took some odd jobs. Like I said, I was living in Daytona Beach. I had just graduated college. And so I was a, a bartender at night and I uh, worked as a lifeguard during the day. And it was an unusual lifeguard. It, was, it wasn't so much about saving people. You worked at pool decks and your main job was selling suntan lotion to the tourists that came down. Mm-hmm. So for me, it, it, that really um, taught me a lot about sales because it's like a lot of these great pitch men you see on TV, yeah. their background really is is – one-on-one sales or one-on-three people sales and they develop really good sales techniques and you have to learn to overcome objections because re- literally if you don't sell the product you don't eat that night right. and 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 you you learn a lot a lot about about sales from those one-on-one approach so i did that but you know having a college degree though i knew that i looked around me and i looked with the people that were working there and that didn't seem like the future for me so again being a big reader at the time i was reading a lot of books um and they fell into two categories. Uh, one were a lot of the um, traditional um, motivational books. When I say motivational books, these were pre-Tony Robbins, you know, Think and Grow Rich, The Power of Thinking Big, The, the Magic of Thinking Big, The Power of Positive Thinking, you know, Norman Vincent Peale, sure, W. Sure. Clement Stone, uh, th- those types of, of, um, of people. And on the other hand, it's like, okay, so how do I – take my skill set and make money and how how are people making a lot of money and um, back then it, w- it it wasn't like I'm money obsessed but it's like how am I making a living and so when I talk about making money it's like you know what am I going to do to become successful and um, uh, so it I was reading a lot of real estate books and down and in the early to mid 80s there was a lot of people um, uh, uh, buying real estate there was an author out of salt lake city called robert allen and he wrote a book called nothing down yeah yeah and you know there's a ton of real estate shows on tv now and there always have been and people are doing seminars so that that started really back in, in probably i mean people have been investing in real estate forever but they've been writing about it and doing seminars in the late 70s early 80s and um i got interested in in doing those books and um and and i just went out and and was starting to buy some uh, houses, fix them up. And then I went to this seminar, um, for this Vietnamese guy, uh, named Tom Vu. And he taught a little bit different. He said, instead of buying a house and fixing it up and then waiting for it to appreciate, buy something that's undervalued and turn around and sell it right away. And now if you think about what's happening on TV, all these flipping seminars and things right, like that, right. that's what he was teaching back, back then. And so I did it and I, I went to his seminar went out and um, I bought a, a house that was a distressed property for $12,000, turned around and sold it in a week for $24,000. And I said, this is great. I'm going to do this for a living. And because, uh, because you know, I, I was the type of person who uh, was independent. I didn't, I, I really probably couldn't work in a big company with a nine to five job. Um, you know, I was entrepreneurial, I guess. So, um what I did uh, next was I, I, I was working on a project and I called them. Uh, no, I was thankful. And I guess this is where the marketing part that just came in that I haven't had a knack for. I was so grateful that that had happened and I had learned this at a seminar. I don't know why I did it. I called um, a business magazine in Florida called Florida Trend. And I told them this story about this Vietnamese immigrant that was teaching people to buy real estate. I was a success story. And lo and behold, they called him up, interviewed him, did a cover story. And he was just starting a seminar business, and that cover story gave him all the credibility in the world and helped launch his seminar wow. business. And I just, it was just something that 
um, I kind of did accidentally, but it, 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 it worked out. So. Mm-hmm. so tell me about your first infomercial. Well, that, that, and that, so that's how I learned with this same person. And, and I have to uh, tell you that um, yeah. I started working with this guy, Tom Vu. He was, a, a, he was less than ethical. He actually got in trouble with mm-hmm. the Florida authorities and things like that. And I did, you know, over the years, and we'll talk about this more as the interview yeah. go on in our industry about ethics and honesty and stuff like that and how important it is. Um, but at the time I was working with him, he was just getting started. Things were fine. There was n- nothing happening. And so anyway, um, one of the guys who uh, – and, and again, this dates back to – the reason you can do infomercials is um, under President Reagan, he deregulated television. Um, before, you could only have six to eight minutes of advertising every hour. Um, and so when Reagan – he de- deregulated a lot of things, airlines, you know, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. One of the things he did was television, and that opened the door to do half-hour infomercials, where by law you couldn't do them before. And um, one of the first the first group of people that were doing them were these real estate guys, and they were using them to drive people to their live seminars. Mm-hmm. And um, and so Tom saw the success. Uh, we were getting maybe you know we would advertise in the newspaper, and if we were lucky, we'd get ten or twenty people to come to a, a free lecture. We went to one that Robert Allen did in Orlando, and there were 600 people in the ballroom. And we said, how did he do that? Wow. Well, he had a half-hour TV show, and the people watched it. It was basically similar to real estate shows you see today that drive people in, into, um, you, you know, to come to a free lecture. And um, so we, we basically said, we need to do one of these. And so working with – we didn't have, no, didn't have any idea how to do it. Uh, so – um, one of the things I liked about Tom is he just kind of cut right to the chase. He said, well, where do they make TV shows? Hollywood. So we went out to Beverly Hills, just started calling around, meeting people. Um, uh, somebody introduced us to a writer. We hired a writer. Um, you know, we were teenage, uh, not teenage, we, you know, we were in our early twenties at the time doing yeah. this. And, um, uh, and we filmed, uh, um, a half hour infomercial and it worked really well, and his business just just boomed. And I was an employee, though I wasn't an owner in any of this. So I was um, learning a lot, doing a lot of the work. Um, uh, but I, I wasn't an owner. I was an you know employed by him and doing it as an employee. Mm-hmm. So that was the very first infomercial. It was a half hour. Then um, we said this is working really well, and this is when it it, it first started to get fun for me. We said okay. Um, the other guys are using an hour show, um, which is really effective. We're going to make an hour show. And this is one where we, I mentioned in my notes, we hired somebody named Mason Adams to be the host. And Mason Adams was a credible guy. And you're, you're always looking for credibility when you're, you're, you're doing these shows. At the time, a popular TV show was Lou Grant. He was the city editor, but he's probably best remembered as the voice for Schmucker's Jam. And then he, he's no longer alive, but at the time, you know, just one of those voices that just, you, 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 um, you know, if it's, presence. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. if it's Schmucker's, it's gotta be good. <laughs> But in, in his in his voice, and he was just like when you saw him on TV, he he was credibility personified. And um, so what was neat about it is what we did is do the same. It's very similar to what I was talking about. Um, you know, the books I read. We we reached out and we tried to interview Norman Vincent Peale, and there was an author named Robert Schwartz who wrote The Magic of Thinking Big. I actually uh, have a funny story. Um, I went into, uh, we did get through to W. Clement Stone, and, and W. Clement Stone if, uh, 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 wrote a bunch of motivational books. You can Google them, go out there, get the book. Sure, sure. He also started um, Success Magazine. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, yeah, he was the founder of Success Magazine. But he also was a very successful businessman. He, and he ran a hundreds of millions of dollar insurance empire. Basically, he started through, through selling door to door. So, um, and he turned out to be a huge, huge political donor. I mean, re- really important guy. And I, and I, I swear, it's a funny, funny story. So I, 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 here I am a teenager. I call him up, say, I want to interview him for a TV show. Um, he's, I'm in Florida. He's in Chicago. So I fly to Chicago. Uh, we go in. Um, uh, his his um, uh, executive assistant is um, out. And she go, and I, so I wait uh, to, to see him for about 20 minutes. She ushers me in, and I swear she ushers me in 
to the to this day it's the biggest office I've ever been in, <laughs> in my entire life and I, I I can't even describe how big this was huge desk couches uh, on the walls are all sorts of pictures of presidents and things like that and and you can imagine how nervous I am I'm there to do an interview for an infomercial you know and so um, I, I sit down and um, I start to uh, ask him a question and the phone rings and it's his uh, secretary and she says, um, uh, Mr. Stone, uh, the president's on the line. And so he goes, uh, could you put him on hold? I'm in the middle of an interview. And it's, and it, if you imagine someone <laughs> saying to put the president on hold and it was just, I was sitting there saying, wow, this is pretty amazing. Or, or I think he said, I'll call him back is what it is, is, is what. And so anyway, we did it, did it, did it, uh, finish that interview. And it was really fun that we interviewed a lot of, um, uh, book authors. We, uh, and, and it was a fun show cause it was half motivation mm -hmm. and half, okay, if you're motivated, uh, to make money, real estate is a way to do it. And, and that was kind of my first fun, um, deal. And it was the last show I made with this, with this Tom Vu guy. And then I, I went out and started to do my own, own thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was your own thing? Your first show? All right. So, I l looked around, so now it's the um, probably the m mid '80s. I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I don't want to confuse the things, but I. Uh, it. Uh, Jimmy. Uh, the economy wasn't real good for real estate. Uh, I remember at the time there were like 17 or 18 percent interest rates. Real estate. We went through a real estate bubble. You know not too long ago. I think that same thing happened and the real estate business was dead. So I said, well, people are interested in making money. And I went to the bookstore and I'm just looking through the bookstore. What, what can we do? And I saw a book on the bookshelf and it said, how to make a million dollars in the stock market. So I said, okay, I bought the book. It was a paperback, four ninety five, And I took it home, read it. And it was a system of how, uh, basically you could invest an equal amount of money, um, you know, over time, I guess it's called dollar cost averaging. And and the author made it into a system and basically said, if you follow this, you know, you can do really well and possibly outperform the stock market. And he wrote a little book about it. So I just, um, you know, at the t you know, look on the inside cover, found out the author. And again, there's no internet back now, so you can't Google and find out where someone is. Right. So I called the publisher, um, told him I wanted to interview the author. The publisher um, gave me his contact information. He lived in a little town in upstate New York. And I told him my idea. I said, hey, I want to use you and this book to make an infomercial. We'll pay you, uh, you know, a royalty on every unit you sell. And he said, okay. So basically, we went in and we made a course of books. And, and again, back then, it was... Um, it wasn't digital downloads. You, you, you know, would have a books and manuals and, uh, cassette tapes and, uh, you know, video, uh, videotapes even before DVDs. And we made up a course and, um, we made that show and this is one where, okay, I'm going out on my own. I haven't, it's scary. I would think it's very scary. I haven't made any, um, really any money yet. And I had to scrape together, um, the money to make this show. And, and so, those infomercials I told you I made uh, for real estate, they were probably $100,000 shows. You know, Tom had money from his businesses and things, and he could do it. So I was able to make the, the, my very first infomercial. A friend um, that was living in Seattle um, was in the fishing business. He um, put up $10,000, and I was able to make the first show I did for $8,000 just by wow. calling in a bunch of favors and, um, Hustling. you know, yeah, hustling basically, and and get started. I don't think you know you can't. Every industry changes, and I know there's opportunities to get started online r relatively cheaply in the TV business. It's changed quite a bit. Back then, you you were able to do something like this. Made this show, and at the time um, we put it on the air, um, uh, there was something called the Fan Financial News Network. And I think it, it, it eventually morphed into like CNBC or one of the business networks mm -hmm. of today. And um, and it was all, you know, people watched it were obviously interested in the stock market. And we just got phenomenal results. We would, you know, back then we would spend a dollar and get three, four, five times return on the dollar you spent. And it was kind of a real, really simple, to, simple business to do. And so that's kind of the thing that, um, you know, kind of got me started on what I do. And... 
uh, you know, my, I told you about my friend that put up the money. He was living in Seattle. The business took off, so I moved out from Florida to Seattle, and that's how I ended up where mm. I am now. So, so in the first one, Rick, tell me, you know, because a lot goes into that, and you're this is a big risk for you. Um, you how oh, did it, it's a big? Oh, go ahead, finish. Your no, question. go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say it is it is a big risk, and it's a huge risk. But on the other hand, um, I think when you're younger. It, it, you don't have a lot to lose. It's, it may be easier to take a risk mm -hmm. um, at, when when you, you don't have a lot of assets and ha and you, you know what I mean. There there wasn't why it was very risky. At the end of the day, if it failed, there wasn't a huge downside to mm -hmm. to me. Um, I I think you know it's it's um, being able to. Um, like you said, hustle, get this started relatively inexpensively, launch. Um, I never really looked at it as a huge risk because if it didn't work, uh, you know, my friend would have been out his money, which is never a good thing. That's that's something that, you, you know, you don't like to get into that that position. Right. Um, but I didn't really look at it as a as a huge risk. And, and um, you know, I was looking at a formula that that um, had worked with the previous shows, the real estate shows. And I said, okay, let's take that same formula and see if it'll work for a stock market show. Mm -hmm. And it did. And, you know, we had we had guest experts. And basically, this was just really an interview. We put the guy who wrote the book, um, How to Make a Million Dollars in a Stock Market, in a talk show format. And we hired a local um, uh, guy. And uh, I actually filmed this in Tampa, Florida. And he was he was uh, had done talk shows before, so he was good at interviewing people. And then we had testimonials. We just uh, you know reached out. People had sent letters to the the book author over the years that had been using the system, and it was kind of just the same thing. It was the person who invented the system. It was successful testimonials that used it, and um, it, it it ended up working really well. What was the hardest part? Because also you, then you have to fulfill on all that product. Yeah, and that and that that was and and again this was. Um, there wasn't really an infomercial industry. Now, you know, when someone starts up, there's giant fulfillment houses, right. and marketing companies, and yeah. all the resources you plug in. We, we like a lot of other entrepreneurs, we ran everything out of a kind of a basement of right. how, yeah. as, as it grew. But we basically, um, so we, we would get all of the products. I'm just thinking you get a thousand calls, but you've got to have these videotapes and these books. I mean, no, and that, and that's what happened. And here's the other thing. Again, starting up on a shoestring, um, we didn't have a lot of inventory, so we had more orders than inventory. So we, you know, people would call. We would we would you know personally call them back. Say, hey, we're you know we'll get this out to you. We're working on it, and right. and and then we would get the products in. We would pack them. Uh, we, we were able to to rent a really small office space, and and. Um, we just did everything out of like a one room office space and yeah. but like it, it was like a combination warehouse customer service and marketing all in in one room type right. of thing yeah. yeah i don't want to make it seem like oh you just put this online and yeah the, the money rolled in because i'm sure you were staying up all night trying to fulfill this stuff oh yeah absolutely and you know but again um one of the uh things and i i don't know i'm going to use the word addictive i don't it's not a, addictive like alcohol I or know what you mean. yeah yeah but it's, it's like to Work really hard, put something out there, and then get people to respond to it. Yeah. That's that's a great feeling. Whether it's a how to make money in real estate, stock market, or selling products like some of the other products we've done, um, really getting people to respond to your marketing message for me gives me a, a. I still get the same thrill I got you know thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. so, so how well did that do? Because then you you put all this money, all this time. Yeah. So anyway, it, it you know our costs were were relatively inex, inexpensive to get started, and it ended up doing total sales of about five million dollars. Wow. And at the time, we're we're young, and uh, we, we, you know, this this was doing that was a lot of money. The margins were really good. We were selling books and tapes. Yeah. And it did it did really really well. And that then said, okay, what's the next project type yeah. of thing? So what'd you do next then? Well, the next one was really interesting because um, we were looking around and saying, um, "What what should we do?" And I, you know, and I don't know how you come across different things, but I definitely have a, a really interesting memory that one of the things we ran across, we didn't move forward with it, was that somebody uh, said, "I have a something that will help with acne," 
And I'm like, well, that can't be that. You know, I don't know. That doesn't make any sense to do. And now you think about proactive. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So it's like there's one you passed on. I'm not to say it was going to be successful or, or whatever, but right. it, I just remember that that happened yeah. back late late 80s. I thought uh, but, you were going to say that proactive came to you and you're like, yeah, that's oh, not that good of an idea. And guys, it was somebody else that had an acne treatment. So. Mm -hmm. We never followed through. But anyway, what's interesting, again, being interested in, in natural health, I'm living out in Seattle. Seattle happened to be the home, uh, and it was just kind of getting started, uh, a college called Bastyr University. It's a yeah. natural. Yeah, uh, heard of it, yeah. And um, they train naturopathic doctors. Anyway, somehow, um, uh, I'm trying to think, I... I uh, I had a friend that we played, that we met, we played basketball with, that was an early graduate of Bastyr. His name was Dr. Michael Murray. And, and if you Google him now, he's like one of the top mm. naturopathic doctors and authors in the country. He's written like 20 books. And wow. anyway, he, 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 inter he first, he introduced me to a guy named uh, Joe Pizzorno. They wrote a book together called The Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine. And um, again, this was right. I had a biology background. I was juicing. I was interested in natural health. This stuff was really great. I was meeting with these people. Anyway, they introduced me to somebody named Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Mm. And I've read one of his books, yeah. Okay, so Jeff lived, lived out in Gig Harbor, and we met with him, and we were looking for our next thing. And Jeff had a, um, a weight loss product that was um, – uh, for a while, there was a, things where you could mix these protein powders in into shakes, and um, you know, uh, basically, you would dr drink just shakes, either uh, starting off like three times a day. It, the The technical name for it is called a protein sparing modified fast. And Jeff um, uh, it was one of the top, um, I guess. Um, he, he, his background was he came from the Linus Pauling Laboratories and did a lot of research on vitamin C. He's very scientific. He's an amazing speaker. Mm -hmm. Everything was clinical studies. So this was a, a, a program he had put together but had trouble selling it. He was doing really well selling products to doctors, naturopathic doctors, but couldn't sell the consumer. We made a consumer version of it, and that was the next um, project. And I learned a, a big lesson here in business. Mm -hmm. um, we we built that business up, and it probably got up to about um, eighteen million in sales in the first year. Wow! And um, what we learned again, we, again, the infomercial business is new. At, almost every infomercial campaign follows a, a pretty significant bell-shaped curve. Um, if it comes out of the gate and it's successful, your stale sh sales rise quickly. What I did this time, starting before, I didn't have a lot of overhead office space. I put a lot of um, uh, overhead in place, you know, staff, people. It was a fast-growing business. But our only marketing channel was the TV itself. Well, all of a sudden, we weren't getting the return on the TV. I, um, and actually, what contributed to it, and I think I wrote this in, in my notes, um, I had the brainstorm of, well, um, so much of these calls are coming in. We should own our own telemarketing company because then that way – Makes we sense. Yeah. Thought, yeah. Instead of like paying someone else to do this, one, you could train your own operators. It could be really specific. But I didn't really understand what was involved in the telemarketing. But anyway, I was making money. I bought a little uh, uh, a local telemarketing company. And I very quickly learned about um, the difficulties of staffing. And, you know, because if one of these shows runs, you might get a thousand calls in in a, in a five-minute time period. How do you answer that? And then if nothing else is coming in, um, you have all that staff to pay. So anyway, I to make a long story short, I you know just round uh, you know ended up making uh, you know a million dollars and losing a million dollars and pretty much really started. oh yes I, in the telemarketing I, oh yeah just just um, just because the coupled the the telemarketing business was there and then also the um, uh, when I the infomercial itself now we had built up overhead. Um, and now the infomercial stopped performing as well as it did. And we, at the time, I didn't know it, but we were on the downside of the bell-shaped curve. And normally what people do today, and, and you know, we, we try to do the same thing, is you make a new show to see if you can recapture. But a lot of times you can't always recapture the magic that you did in the first one. In this case, we didn't. We didn't really have any other marketing channels when the TV revenue started to decline. Um, we ended up... Um, 
you know, having to shut that business down and lost a bunch of money. So it, again, when something like that happens, you learn very valuable lessons, expensive lessons. So, so I mean, that's pretty remarkable from, from to $18 million in a year. Yeah. What was working with that and what, what didn't work towards the end? Well, well um, again, and here's, here's the thing, uh, you know, I was fortunate just maybe, I don't know if how much was um, chance and, uh, and how much was actually like, you know, making wise choices, but we were fortunate in our first several infomercial projects to work in categories that are still successful today. There's certain categories that work on TV. Uh, you know, I'll put the real estate and the stock thing under what we like to call get rich quick or right. business, business opportunity. However, there's lots of different names, mm-hmm. but it's a way for people who want to supplement their income, uh, make additional money. And that's a category that still goes strong today. Um, the diet industry, um, it's always going to be there. Right. Uh, you know, the next new and latest diet. So our second big project was in, you know, the weight loss and diet, another great infomercial category. And, you know, we were fortunate to be in, 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 in those two. Um, and so the reason that that was so successful, one, it, it, the infomercial business back then was a lot easier to do, a lot easier to make money. It was a, a you know, a new industry. Uh, the responses were great. And, uh, you know, what, what killed the response, literally, um, and it's something I, I have fought for years and years and years, is the un- a lot of unsavory characters come into the industry. It's mm-hmm. an easy way to make money. They overpromise and underdeliver. They rip off the consumer. And soon the consumer gets wary of buying something from TV. Yeah. But it's people in the industry that created that situation. And that's one of the, why the, one of the biggest things I mentioned it earlier, we're always trying to establish credibility um, with the consumer. Because if they believe what you're saying, then they'll buy, buy your, your product. And they want to know that they are, are dealing with a reputable company. Anyway... Um, it was it was successful because it was a great category, and it was also my first um, uh, working with a consumable product, so that you captured the mm. uh, customer on the front end. But then it was something where they would reorder, or in the case of a weight loss, you know, it might cost uh, thirty nine dollars for the initial order, but the operator would say, "Okay, how much weight you need to lose? We we estimate if you stay on the program, you could lose this much per week." So you would need X and you could take that initial order and turn it from 39 into 89 or mm-hmm. 99 or, or whatever. And then people would reorder. So it had a natural, you know, tail to the a revenue stream, ongoing revenue stream to the to the business. And again, you know, doing this, these are lessons and lessons that I learned in that business, things that did went right, things that went wrong. Later, when we worked with OxyClean, which was another consumable product, you know, every time you do a new project, you learn something you can adapt, adapt and use in a, in a later product. Yeah. So would you say, I guess uh, the biggest thing, was there anything unexpected that you, like a disadvantage of working with um, like an ingestible or consumable product that you didn't expect with that type of oh, yeah. product? It, it was the first time um, we really had to deal with, um, and we didn't get any problems with the FTC, but you have to really be aware of the advertising laws, Mm -hmm. um, the the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission rules about what you can say, what you can't say, how you have to support your health claims, and also the FDA when you're dealing with, with with a consumable product. You can't go out and say, oh, take this product and you know, you'll cure cancer or whatever. And so it, it, it was a very good learning experience from that aspect. And we were fortunate in working with um, Dr. Bland that he was very aware of all this and was probably be- better situated than anybody to support his product with clinical studies. So yeah. we went into that with our eyes wide open, but really did, um, you know, if you can't just say you can lose uh, 10 pounds in a week if you just take this, you know, you have to diet, exercise, you know, there's a whole program. Right. So I learned a lot about um, uh, uh, advertising law, w- working with that with that project. Mm-hmm. And again, this is still in the early days of, you know, we're still talking about late late 80s here. This was prior to starting the juice man business. So yeah. uh, learned a lot about um, uh, making health claims and what you could do and couldn't do. Yeah. And, um, and it's like on a, on a one hand, the marketing side, you always want to try to make, as robust claims as possible, but 
you you won you you, you don't want to back them up exactly you have to back them up yeah so so tell me about let's talk about some of the most successful campaigns and what made them effective i mean you have the juice man sonicare george foreman grill oxyclean and even gopro what tell me about juice man what made it so successful what was juice effective man. Yeah, Juice Man's still my favorite just because of the category and my. Per I mean, I still juice today twice yeah. a day. I, I juice, I, I do smoothies, yeah. Yeah, and and yeah, and I, I do more smoothies now than I used to, but I. Um, but anyway, so juicing the juicing one was always my personal favorite, and um, it it um, what I, what I really liked about that project more than anything else was how much good if you put a juicer in someone's kitchen and they used it, how much benefit that they would get from that. And we would get, and uh, you talk about something, that was a business where we grew from zero, uh, we were doing 75 million after three years Amazing. in sales, yeah. and we, ha we had a big, we had, we had a big staff, we, um, there was, I think there was over 100 employees, it was a, a fast growing company, and, um, but it was really fun how much you could change people's lives, um, all the different benefits that, 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 you know, that you, that you Huge can get. Huge benefits, yeah huge, huge benefits. And we would get that response from people. So that, that one was uh, of all the ones, you know, it was one of the earlier successes, but it was also one that I had a passion, uh, a really large personal passion for, um, probably was my, my, my favorite. And, um, and ma mainly just from the standpoint of how much it, 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 it helped people. And you have to give, uh, you know, Jay and Linda Cordich a lot of credit. They, they, um, had been out doing this, kind of just going from, you know, really sometimes when I first met them, working out of a car, driving from city to city, um, going and doing, you know, little lectures at health food stores, things like that, kind of the old way um, of, of promoting a product and, and making a business. And we were able to basically use the television and infomercial. I like to, to, you know, use the analogy. It's like, okay, if you have a s small, successful business selling a product. I don't care if you're selling, you know, 10,000 uh, a, a month or 20,000 a year, or whatever, dollar wise, if, if you're getting good consumer response, you can take the TV and it's like putting a magnifying glass on the business. You can just, it, you can take the basic sales message, the basic success you're having with that one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three or one-on-five sales message and use the TV to really reach um, take that same message, but reach many more people. Yeah, they so. proved it out. And it sounds like same with OxyClean. They were doing a lot of fairs and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and again, it was a ve again, very similar situation. So anyway, first of all, one, one really important thing to mention, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the products you mentioned, you can't use great marketing to make a poor product successful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you hit a point where you can get somebody to buy something, but part of what you're doing is you're. I always it's like a snowball effect. If you have a good product, like you you're able to sell the juicer, you end up um, getting a lot of word of mouth. They tell their friends, their neighbors, and it it creates you you know it starts to grow. And what you're doing, the marketing is planting the seeds to help a a, a business grow like that. And it, you can't if you have a bad product you get it out into somebody's hands and then it starts to hit a dead end. So all of these products that have been successful um, really start with with a really great product that solved the need and um, and that when people got it, they liked it enough where they would tell other people and it would help help the business grow. Mm -hmm. so really, what, some really basic principles on all of them, um, uh, you, you know, but then that's the foundation to help build the bigger, you know, the bigger business. Yeah. I want to ask about the juice man more, but, but you bring up a good point. What's something that came across your desk that may be a good product, but didn't really solve a need, uh, pain and you had to pass on it. Yeah. And you know, and here, here's a, uh, one of the things that I, I, I like to look at in, in, in the way I approach marketing is maybe when I was getting started very, very early in my career, it was not so much. It was like, if I thought something, we could sell something and make money, I would do it. Now it's, I really don't look at products like that. So, so maybe something will come across our desk, but it's like, um, could be successful, but I, I, I don't really want to do it unless it's a product that I like and I believe in mm -hmm. and I can really get behind. 
right. on, uh, you know, and, and actually, you know, all the products you mentioned, um, I have all those in my house. I use them every mm. day and, and it, you know, I actually it, do too. <laughs> so yeah. so it's, it's, it, that's kind of like, um, a screening thing for me, yeah. uh, when it comes to products, because obviously as we've, we've become more successful and have a track record, we get approached to do lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I won't do things unless they, they, they're good products. And, and, um, so that, that's kind of the first screening thing. So, um, there, you know, there, we see all, all sorts of stuff come in. Um, That's why I ask. I'm sure you see so much come across your desk. Yeah, and really, I, I, I look at them now in the context. A lot of a lot of the products that, if you look at them, they come in. They're it's a good product. They they solve a problem. It's something I would use myself. And then the last part of it is um, because everyone's time is limited, and um, we we've kept our marketing company fairly small, so I'm fairly hands on on most of the projects I do. Yeah. Um, you know, we've learned a lot about working with good management teams. And if a product comes in, or it's a small startup company, uh, sometimes we'll pass if we don't feel comfortable with the people that are running the company or running the the, the product. And and so that's just as almost as important as the. Um, uh, as the product itself, and a good example of that is the uh, Sonicare, probably one of the best marketing teams we we management teams we've used. I, the the person who started Sonicare, David Giuliani, um, was named a Small Business Person of the Year two years in a row. Mm. Um, so we work with Sonicare, but then we uh, they sold that company to Philips. Um, we can talk about that story in more detail. Mm. Um, uh, and then they started Clarisonic, and we basically worked with them again. And so, what's Clarisonic? Clarisonic is um, you can go to any um, beauty store, Nordstrom, Ulta. It's the face. It's the face cleanser that uses Sonic. Uh, it, it looks like a, a handle and a brush. Okay. And uh, to give you an idea, Clarisonic they they started that up after they sold the Sonicare business, and in in six years or seven years, they went from zero. To more than 200 million in wow. sales, and they sold it to L'Oreal for 500 million dollars. Amazing. Yeah, the same management team, same technology, Sonic technology. One was a toothbrush, and one they uh, applied to a face, uh, a facial, facial, you know, facial cleanser. Yeah. So, what were some of the things that were effective with the Sonicare, and then that they employed with the the Clear Sonic? Um. How did they so, find you in the first place? Well, well, the yeah. Let's go back to the Sonicare one. We had had the success with the Juice Man. We sold that business. Um, one of my partners in the Juice Man business called me one day and said, "Hey, there's a, a startup company over in I, I live in Seattle, Bellevue, Washington is the kind of the newer part of, and that's where Microsoft is located. And uh, anyway, there's a startup company in Bellevue um, called Optiva." And they wanted to talk to you about using the same type of marketing that um, you did with the Juice Man. So I went over and met with them, and there was probably ten people working at the company. They were doing a couple million dollars in sales, um, and it was the Sonicare toothbrush. And the problem they had, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, yeah. it was a hundred fifty dollar yeah. toothbrush trying to launch into retail. No retailer would talk to them because it one they it was a it was a new product. If you put a hundred fifty dollar toothbrush on the shelf without explaining what it did, nobody would buy it. So they couldn't penetrate retail, and all of their sales were coming through um, mailing lists, direct channels. I think their biggest channel was. Um, uh, I don't know if you remember out of Chicago, there was a guy named Paul Harvey that used to do radio um, mm -hmm. snippets. And anyway, he, he did um, uh, basically um, some radio ads. And so they were doing direct marketing on a small scale and having success because it was such a great product, but really couldn't crack the code on how to, how to grow the business from there. So I actually did um, – uh, an entrepreneurial deal with them where I put up uh, half the money for the infomercial in return for a small royalty and um, uh, we um, you know we made the infomercial and this was one where we, we again it again it fit right into my background we had a very scientific approach I went down to the dent dental show in Moscone Center in San Francisco 
and um, we were able to interview like the head of the Harvard Dental School and the head of the USC Dental School and there was a scientist from the University of Washington on a Sonicare staff and Optiva staff and he knew all these people. So again, we we're interviewing all these top uh, uh, periodontists and dentists mm -hmm. and uh, it, again, fascinating to be able to sit down and talk to these people and a ask questions and things. But really what, what that we did with that show is we really educated people about what gum disease was, why the conventional ways of treating it weren't working and how a product like Sonicare could help reverse the effects of gum disease because it cleaned beyond the bristles. And that was really the benefit of the Sonicare, being able to clean beyond the bristles. And that was the marketing message that set us apart from every other product out there. So, so then what else was working? Because they come to you with the Sonicare. Yeah. And then what do you, I mean, did, was it off out of the gate just working with the infomercials or was there, was there any so, friction? We knew, no, we knew right away that, um, okay, we, we wanted to do a half, they wanted to copy the juice man model where we made a half hour show. They saw the success we had. Um, and you know what, what really struck them and, and really the, the thing that the juice man, it, it, it blazed, um, some new trails in a lot of areas, but one of the biggest areas was it was one of the first times where people made the connection between running a successful infomercial and the effect it had on, on retail sales. At the time, we didn't know it. We were a direct response business only. We only sold from TV. We were doing live seminars. Um, but every time we'd come to a city, um, the, the, the brawn juicers and the different kind of juicer manufacturers, they would all get sold out on the retail shelves. And so we finally figured that out and, you know, got out into the retail, into the retail world. But it was really the first time where you could show a connection where how the infomercial could build a brand and drive retail sales. And so you not only would have the direct sales, you could also get, you know, count in the, the retail sales when, uh, again, you know, against your marketing dollars. So I think that that's what Sonicare was interested in initially is really ha how to launch this product, how to tell the story. The half hour infomercial is really great for um, educating people about a product and creating awareness at the same time why it's such a powerful tool and how it and and how it works to create large businesses out of these small businesses is you're getting money back on your advertising dollar so when we run the the Sonicare infomercial um, you know if we spend a thousand dollars on a TV station um, we're hoping to get back uh, you know, two thousand dollars in revenue, so it pays for the advertising. You take that money, you put it right back in, and it really enables a very small company that could never have this kind of advertising budget to leverage their advertising. And that's the secret. You know, the more you're on TV, the more you can build the brand. And that was a model that you know, Sonicare, Claire Sonic, uh, uh, you know, OxyClean, all the ones that are on on the list that we worked in used used it that same way. And it's a little bit different when you compare it to, you know, look at OxyClean. How does um, uh, Procter & Gamble launch a product? In the past, at the time, they would come up with a new product and they would they had a budget to spend $10 million. Well, if you know, small companies can't do that. They didn't have the budget. Right. But the infomercial provided the advertising, you know, paid for advertising to give them the TV exposure to build the brand. Mm -hmm. There were a couple there were a couple of interesting things from your book um, by now that about the juice man. And one was with the juice man, you said you deliberately took two years before you did the infomercial. Mm -hmm. And then two, what was interesting is you had a national distributor roll everything out at once. And you said if you were to do it again, you would have rolled it out slower. Oh, yeah. So uh, I thought those were both uh, interesting, and I'm, I'm wondering why. Yeah, so anyway, when we started doing the Juice Man business, um, we actually, um, again, so here, you, I mentioned earlier, you kind of learn something every time you do a project. So I learned how to do the live seminar business when we were promoting the real estate courses. And I took that concept and said, maybe people will respond to – a health seminar in the same way they responded to to a, a real estate seminar and so what we did is we started the juice man business really going around the country um, doing live seminars very similar where um, people would see an advertisement um, and and we actually did have a TV show um, 
uh, but we didn't sell the product direct to the consumer. The TV, a commercial would come on. It was a half hour show. It was Jay Cordage, uh, you know, talking about juicing. A commercial would come on, and the commercial would invite people to come see Jay in person at a at a local hotel ballroom. And um, and that, and then we they would come, and then Jay would do a ninety minute lecture about juicing and at the end and then we would be sell the juicers and we didn't eat, we didn't have them there but we'd take the orders and then we'd ship them out from our office in Seattle so we started the first couple of years we just really were doing a live seminar business um it was it it it, it just it became so successful that Jay, we ended up having eight teams and we were in eight different cities every week and we got different lecturers to go and do the different juicing seminars and taking Jay's basic message um and and doing that. So anyway, we started that business really just doing the live seminar approach. And really, I, I wanted to, um, having had the experience with the weight loss product of building a business up really quickly, um, just with infomercial alone, I wanted to have other marketing channels. And the mm-hmm. seminar was a good one. So we had seminar. Then it, then when the time was right, we started, basically took the same infomercial and um, uh, put in a commercial where people could then buy it directly from TV mm-hmm. and made that transition. And we were still doing seminars at the same time. But I think it's a real funny story how the juice, uh, how we, how we did the juice man infomercial or my first experience yes. working, yeah. working with Jay. Um, and again, a, 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 an important component of all this marketing, there's a really, I, I don't know, uh, I've learned over the years and, uh, that there's a synergistic way to put together your marketing where, Every aspect of it is working together. And uh, giving a good example, when we do the infomercials, if you have a spokesperson like Jay Cordich um, or Billy Mays or different people uh, or even any spokesperson that, that you can use, uh, and a real important aspect in marketing is the PR part of it, where you could get somebody on local talk shows, newspaper interviews, things like that. So we um, uh, – uh, I'm not sh- uh, sure how how I got this connection, but somebody referred me to a small startup PR firm in New York City called Jericho Promotions. A guy named Eric Yaverbaum, and um, Eric and his and his partner um, were just starting out. And um, I went to them and said, "Hey, I'd like to." Jay's quite a, quite a good personality. I'd like to get him somewhere. So they were able to book him on a on a TV station in New York called WOR and WOR was one of the first super stations like TBS. I mean, it it went beyond the New York area and they did a, um, the host of this morning show, um, was somebody named Richard Bay and he had a, it was called the Richard Bay show and it was on New York, New York and he had just had different guests. It was a variety show, you know, different guests would come on all the time. So um, Jay went on WOR, and never, never forget this, it was, I think his appearance was the end of June um, in 1989, and um, basically Jay was on a, did a 20-minute segment, he made juice, he, did, he was his you know, normal self, really high energy, and um, basically he said, uh, if any of you would like um, uh, a free recipe, uh, recipes, send us a dollar uh, and he gave out, and they and the station put up our office address in Seattle, and that was the and that was probably up for thirty seconds, and so um, you know the station said you know called us after Jay's appearance said oh that was the best appearance our switchboard was lit up everyone wanted information and we're back in Seattle and I was like well that was a great uh, you know appearance but it didn't really help us for sales, and so it was the end of June uh, the July Fourth holiday was coming up you know took a few days off. And I'll never remember, I think July 5th or 6th, whatever it was, was a Monday or whatever. And um, a mail truck pulls up in front of our office and the mailman gets out and he's got one of these, and I don't even know if they still use them, these huge canvas sacks that they put, you know, mail letters in. And um, he's got one of these on his shoulder and he comes in the office and it's full of people requesting um, uh, free re- the recipes for a wow. dollar. And and he goes back out to the truck, gets another sack. Anyway, to make a long story short, he ends up bringing in four of these giant sacks. Jeez. We, we got eighteen thousand dollars in in one dollar bills um, from people getting the the wanting the recipes. We had to send out all those recipes, but really that launched the business. We had a then had a database at those eighteen thousand people. We were able to sell obviously quite a high. And 
out a brochure, you know, and then we we launched the business that way. But it really showed you the power of one uh, Jay's message, but also using PR. So when we started doing the seminars, and we not only were doing TV, every city we'd go to, we'd try to get Jay a PR appearance and then tell people, um, you know, where they could come. And the other benefit of PR is really from a credibility standpoint. You know, people are only going to believe so much they see in an infomercial, but if they see that person on the local news or a, a, a story in the local paper, mm-hmm. um, it, it's it's credible and they believe it and they'll respond to that message a little bit better than they would the infomercial. Mm-hmm. So, so I, oh, my answers are seeming to get pretty long here. Yeah. I love your answers. I mean, you have to respond to those one by one. You got like 15,000 or 18,000 letters? 1,000 and... Um, my sister, I got my sister to help me, and I think there was one other person. And yes, we responded to every one of them wow. with um, basically we had to go out to a print shop. Uh, we had a brochure that we were using in our seminars that had juice recipes. We got you know those printed up, sent them out, but included in the recipe was was a sales piece you know this is nothing formal i mean a little way you could order the juicer and so it was basically a very targeted audience of people that responded to jay they got the recipes and but there was a sales piece and and it generated a a a bunch of um juicer sales which really helped launch the business yeah Rick, I have a lot more questions, but we're right at the hour, so I want to make sure that uh, I know you have, you have things to do, um, so I don't know if you want to continue this another time, or what? Uh... Um, I'll tell you what, let's go, how about if we go for another um, 15 minutes or sure. so? Yeah, All sounds right. good. And then, uh, I don't know if you ever do a part two, I'd yeah. be happy back for a part two. Let's do a part two, if you're up for it. To do two, so. Yeah, if you're up for it, for sure. Because there's too much good stuff to to cover here, you know what, what I found interesting too with with the book and with the Juice Man was one you deliberately waited two years where a lot of people you know now people want to just you know proof of concept they just want to get up and running as quickly as possible and you probably knew that you could blow this up with an infomercial or other marketing efforts and mm-hmm. you deliberately kind of built it from what you you did before with the, uh, with, I guess, Jeffrey Bland. Right. Um, and the second thing I thought was interesting was the national distribution, right? Yeah. Because you, I would think everyone's dream, you just roll it all out at once. You go everywhere. And, and I thought it was interesting. The comment you made was if I were to do it again, I would have rolled it out slowly. So I want you yeah, to talk I, about that. Really up until this point, I hadn't had any experience with retail marketing or how the retail market, uh, you know, when I say retail, putting it on stores like mm-hmm. Macy's, Costco, uh, you know, the, the different. And, and there's definitely a specific approach when launching a product you, you should take with a different products are different, but you have to approach the retail a little bit um, carefully. And so what we did is, um, you know, Jay at the time was one of the you know, the biggest the juice man when it was out there, it was one of the big, I mean, 2020 was doing stories. I mean, he was on good morning. I mean, he, he was like everywhere. So we had people approaching us. And so we, we, um, uh, and the retailers, there's a huge demand at retail and we weren't at retail yet. And so we had people approaching to us. And so what, what we ended up doing was working with a, um, company called PhD professional housewares distributors. Mm-hmm. And they were like a middleman that would basically take your product, put it in their warehouse, and then distribute it out to all the different retailers, take the product back. I mean, you know, retail is a different, different type of the beast. Yeah, it is. It, it is. And so we didn't have any experience. So we went with them. And I think what they, uh, and the way we approached retail was very interesting. And again, it's a, a way we, we still use with, with products where it, it makes sense is we had the main juice machine. Uh, which at the time uh, I believe was three hundred dollars, um, and we created what we called the Juice Man Junior, and that was our retail unit. And so that was enabled. Again, there's a whole thing you know you talk about today with map pricing and keeping your pricing integrity. And that was one of the simple ways we did it back then was just coming with a smaller unit that was out in retail, and um, so they just basically put it out everywhere as quickly as possible took as many orders as possible and it just it was pretty it was too much too fast growth too quickly and we couldn't really management so 
you know, to answer your question, again, there's a way where you can go and, and introduce it a little bit slower at certain retailers, get a really good base and a feel for things and how you can support it, and then go to the next one and go to the next one. And that's that's kind of, um, if you, if that that's the way, and back then at least, it would have made more sense to do that. Now, the certain products, it is a race to the market because you really don't have uh, product protection, right. and so you want to grab as much market share as you can. But that, but that's where branding comes in. And the more you can create a branded product, the more protection it'll give you in the marketplace. That people will go to a store and they'll buy your brand versus some somebody else. So yeah, that's why I thought it was an interesting statement. Because on one hand, in the book, you're like, just get it out as quick as possible. On the other hand, sometimes you wish you would have waited a little bit or done it slower. Yeah, yeah, and, and again. Uh, not every 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 situation every product is different yeah. and you really again it's just a bit, you know learning from mistakes of the past to help you know do it correctly the next time mm -hmm. in that particular one you know they always say hindsight's 2020 in that particular right. instance that's that's something i think we would have done a little bit a little bit differently yeah so you know it may sound obvious now but you came out with the idea to have a smaller unit of the juice right. man how did you come up with that um you know, we were looking at, uh, well, two things. One thing we did know about retail, if we were to take the TV unit or direct-to-consumer unit and put it in retail, and, and this still happens to way, today, the way retailers sell product is by discounting it. And it's very hard to support a price. So we knew that if we put our bigger unit out there, there would be, you know, huge price erosion. Um, so... It was really just kind of, I think, strategic brainstorming to come up, say, okay, can we put make a smaller unit? It's a, it's a, you know, it's it's a more of an introductory juicer to to get people into. By pricing it at ninety nine dollars, you're able to capture a much bigger uh, part of the market. You also were able to get people that maybe were on the borderline of where they wanted to try juicing. They didn't want to spend that much on a juicer. And um, and if they liked it, a lot of times they would upgrade from the smaller unit to the larger unit. So it really just came out of a bunch of strategic discussions of what was happening in the marketplace. You know, great strategy for us. So and and what it does enable you to do and it, it get a little bit more specific. And we run into this every day now, and especially with now trying to keep map pricing on the internet with products. But your TV product, we always try to make the most expensive from the standpoint not the same product that you're selling for more but whatever package you're selling on TV is the highest price and that creates your umbrella and then it allows you to have other marketing channels um, where you, you you price different products um, depending on the channel at, at different different prices but your TV is your main advertising vehicle it sets that highest price and you can either do that by having a better unit bigger motor uh, more features are putting more products, um, uh, support products in a package, so they're getting a, a bigger value than they would at the retail. Mm -hmm. You know, Rick. Also, you know, with the Juice Man, it grew from zero to seventy-five million, or you know, from whatever they were doing to seventy-five million a year. What were some of the? Obviously, you know, it sounds amazing. What were some of the challenges though with that growth? Well. Um, the challenges uh, were, and they were fun challenges. The, the part, some of them were fun, and some of them were parts of the business that that aren't so much fun, at least for me. Mm -hmm. The the fun parts were we started out um, when we met Jay. He was selling a juice machine that was actually um, it was uh, imported by a Swiss company called Rotel of Switzerland. They're still a small Swiss manufacturing company. They actually made the product over in Poland, though, um, and it wasn't. It was it was an effective juicer. I still have one of these original Juice Man, but it was really clunky. It wasn't a great product, so we had to do um, you know new product development. Mm. We, we we hired engineers. We made up basically a juicer from scratch that was what we felt the marketplace needed. There was nothing like it out there. Up until this time, there were very few, like now you can go out and you can buy really nice stainless steel, expensive juicers, powerful motors. Th those didn't exist. There were a lot of what I call cheap juicers where you literally could put a carrot in and the motor would bog down. And one of the benefits we had, even though that this uh, original juicer wasn't great, it did have a powerful motor and enabled you to, to really juice effectively. 
and so what we did is just come up, uh, designed a new machine. We had to source out that, or do we make it in China? We ended up making it in Korea. The quality was much better in Korea. And um, that 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 was uh, a challenge, but one of a fun challenge to work to work on. Um, the 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 part that I don't like of a fast growing business right. is, um, uh, I guess the 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 people part. Not, not that I'm anti people, but I mean when when you start off a small business and it's three people, and we ended up growing at one point we had 160 employees. Yeah. how do you do that? That's not um, you know yeah that's not. I'm a marketing guy. I'm not a, you know, that, so the, so that's the part that, that from a fast growth business that I mm -hmm. guess was l less appealing. Yeah. So the challenges well, of the challenges of, yeah, yeah. of growing to 160 people, because that's a whole nother animal. Now you're, oh yeah, it, it is. And, and, um, you know, hiring good people. Um, we were talking, what we were talking about was, um, things you can do internally versus outsourcing. Yeah. And, um, you know, today you can, you can run a business that big and, and outsource a lot of these functions. We did everything internally. Yeah. We did our own fulfillment, our own warehouse, uh, own customer service department, own sales department. And it's good, you know, the benefit of doing things internally like that is you have a lot more control over the people and the messaging and what's being said and uh, that type of thing. The, the negative part is, is is the overhead then that you have to support on ongoing and so it's always a balance and you know anybody that's building a a business today you know you, you uh, one is you always want to keep your overhead costs as low as possible obviously mm -hmm. but you know there there are opportunities to outsource a majority of them and you just have to make a decision which which way is the best to to go for your particular business yeah.